Coming up on Artifacts, an illuminating interview with one of the world's foremost modern architects, Ralph Rapson. Plus, previews of two awesome April events, the Minnesota Music Academy's Icebreaker and the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Film Festival. Right, right here, here, right, right now, now, on, on Artifacts. Artifacts. <laughs> that was good. Hello everyone, I'm Janet Zahn with the Minneapolis Office of Film, Video and Recording. And I'm Phil Lindsay with the Minneapolis Community Development Agency and this is Artifact. The show that brings the arts in Minneapolis home to you. Now this month we're especially proud to welcome architect Ralph Rapson to our studios for an extended interview. Rapson and his work are the subject of two exhibits now on view at the Weissman Art Museum and the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And what a pleasure it will be to talk with him about his work and the field of architecture. I've been looking forward to this interview for a good long while. And you will have a good long while to talk with the master later in the show. But first, we do have two other important subjects to cover on Artifacts this month. Starting with the Minnesota Music Academy's annual Icebreaker event. The Icebreaker is a five-day celebration of Minnesota music, and event coordinator Mean Larry will be here to tell us all about it. And then Al Milgram will bring you the latest on the largest film event in the Upper Midwest. That's the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Film Festival, which is running April 16th through the May 1st time at many theaters around the Twin Cities. A mean but not scary. Larry is up next right after this art quote. It's a big month for Minnesota music, and with me is Mean Larry to tell us all about the Minnesota Music Academy Icebreaker. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Me too. Yeah, I bet. Um, you are working hard trying to put this event together. I want to hear just kind of give me the basics. Who, what, when, where, why? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> the, uh, the Icebreaker Music Conference. Mm -hmm. It is a, a, a celebration of Minnesota music. It starts on April 21st, and it runs through the 25th. Five That's days? Five, five days, something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. Wednesday through Sunday. Um, we kick off with the award show on Wednesday night at First Avenue. Um, seminar Saturday was a big day for us. That happens at Music Tech, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that'll go from uh, 12 to 6. Mm -hmm. And then we have some uh, surprise kind of uh, ending showcases happening on Sunday. You know, that's all kind of a to-be-announced sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, tell me, Larry. I know that you work hard on this event, or you have been for the last several years. What's the what's the purpose? What's the what, uh, why you're doing this? I'm just trying to bring the Minnesota com music community together. You know, that's uh, celebrate the Minnesota music, the talent we have, the venues, the uh, uh, the fans, everything. You know, mm -hmm. just bring bring everybody together for this one weekend. Big five days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more. Give me a little bit more information about the seminars on Saturday. What are you going to be offering there? Uh, seminar Saturday. That's again. That's at Music Tech. Mm -hmm. Starts at noon. Uh, we have uh, uh, a mentoring session that goes on and. Uh, and, and that happens all day long where people get to meet um, you know, folks in the industry and get some insight about mm -hmm. uh, uh, how to pr move forward with their career. Sure. We're going to have a marketing promotion seminar. Um, we're going to have a networking seminar. We're going to have uh, an A&R seminar, um, booking and touring. Uh, the Minnesota State Bar Association, the art and entertainment section, they're going to come in and, and do a street legal where they're going to give some uh, free legal advice, so that'll be really nice. Mm -hmm. um, ASCAP is coming up to help us out with the uh, copyright and publishing seminar. And then, of course, we have our Demo Listen Live, which is headed up by Jim Meyer uh, of uh, Request Magazine. And, and that so that... It's, it's like going to be a big day. Really it's full a, day. It's huge, yeah. And you know, what? I think that's an important piece of what this, this uh, event is about, too, because music isn't only mu making music, it is a business. Right, it's a, it's a business, and, and, and you know, besides honoring and recognizing musicians, we want to educate as well, mm -hmm. and, you know, and push them forward. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Music Awards, what's happening with that? Oh, nothing. <laughs> Oh, no, no the, yeah, this is a little thing that we have going on. Yeah. Uh, that's, 20, that's the 21st, Wednesday night. Uh, at 6 o'clock, we open the doors, and there's a nomination reception. Uh, Brian Oak and uh, Mary Lucia are, are hosting that event. We give away some awards early. And then at 8 o'clock, the whole thing kicks off. Robin Robinson is our host again this year, and we have a whole slew of other presenters. Uh, Mark Wheat, Jennifer Downham, uh, Chris Osgood, folks like that are going to be coming up to hand out some awards. 
and we have more music this year than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 7th Street entry, which adjoins the uh, First Avenue, uh, that's the new band showcase. Um, so the best of the new bands are playing there at, during, the, during the award show. And those guys are uh, Bell Weather, Deb Brown and Blonde Faith, uh, The Hotheads, Love Cars, The Mason Jennings Band, and Plastic Constellations. Then, <laughs> if that's not enough, then up in the VIP room, yeah. We have uh, the best club DJs performing up there, and that's going to be uh, DJ's Ability, Bionic, Cat in the Hat, Dean Vaccaro, Francisco, and Jesus Juice. Hey. Now, we're not even in the main room yet. <laughs> well, keep going, keep going. I'm, I'm going, I'm going. Yep. So, uh, we got about 15 or 16 acts going on in the main room. Uh, Abstract Pack, Becky Schlegel and True Blue, Black Power, uh, Brenda Weiler, Debbie Duncan with Sanford Moore, uh, Dylan Hicks, Eddie Berger, Fode Bangora, Gao Hung, Janice Figured, John Hermanson, Lamont Cranston, the Nautilus Music Theater is going to perform a piece there, uh, Three Minute Hero, Thrush, Vic Bellari, and his Bellari Lounge Orchestra. This is something, if you are into music, that this is an event you shouldn't miss. If you miss it, mm -hmm. then you were somewhere else. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. The bottom line is that that's very right. true. Um, so we got Wednesday night, the big awards. Um, sure. What's happening Thursday, Friday, in between that and we the got, seminars? We got showcases going mm -hmm. on throughout the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one thing we've been working very hard to get. Uh, uh, we've got venues in Duluth. We have venues in St. Cloud, Mankato, St. Peter. Hmm. We're really trying to reach out in Zimbroda. Uh, we're really trying to broaden our reach and not have it just a Twin Cities event. Mm -hmm. And, and um, locally, we have some nice uh, showcases. Cases. Mike Merz is having a CD release party at Lee's Liquor Lounge. Um, Rob Rule, of course, does a huge job over at the Turf Club. And, and Joe over at Ryan's does a great job in the coffee grounds. So they, they are all going to be putting on lots of showcases, big, big events. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be an all-ages affair at Fox Fire, which is going to be kind of a first thing for us, the first time this year for us uh, mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but outstate, we've got Stuart Davis. He's performing at, uh, in, in Morris at Carl's Coffee Shop. And uh, the red carpet in St. Cloud and KBSC, they're, they're going to be putting on a, a nice uh, showcase mm -hmm. as well. So we get all kinds of things going on. Yep. And it is, after all, Minnesota Music Minnesota Academy, Music. and that's why you're trying yep. to do it? Yep. That's great. We have just a couple uh, seconds left here, Larry. Mm -hmm. This is a quick one. Um, tell me about the laminates. How do people purchase those? That's part of how you get into all this stuff, right? right. Members, uh, of course, get laminates for free, uh, but the general public can purchase uh, a, a laminate or become a member of the MMA. Uh, and you can call the uh, the hotline or, or, or check us out on our website um, but the purchase laminates it's uh, it, they are at all First Avenue ticket outlets okay. um, so now I'm gonna pass the ball to First Avenue mm -hmm. so you go look at a, a First Avenue poster and you're gonna see the the outline of all their ticket outlets and that's where the laminates are sold okay let's um, get the hotline number here for the Minnesota Music Academy on the screen so people know where to call that's six five one two two nine three one two one and the website is bitstream, B-I-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot net slash forward slash M-M-A. Yep. Good stuff you're doing, Larry. Congratulations. Great. I hope it all much. goes well oh, and go uh, hope to see you again um, soon. I'll see you next year. Absolutely. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Next up, you'll get the word on the Minneapolis St. Paul Film Festival. Festival, but first, a celebration of Minnesota music and Minnesota filmmakers. Here's a movie trailer from Funky Town, the motion picture. Stephen Greenberg, executive producer and director. Scott Turk, producer. Talk about it. Can underdogs succeed in the music business? Here comes Funky Town, the movie. I call people Aya, and people call me that too, but Aya means uh, brethren or brother in uh, Jamaican Patois. It was a very natural thing to, uh, to call myself and other people. The big P word is persistence. It's just going to be persistent. Our only hope was to, to really have a grassroots following and not get too tripped up on the big brass ring with ultimate gold. Does it feel real? Does it feel real? Well, we 
been together for three years now and right about to put out our first record. Uh, we're very excited. It sounds great and everyone's going to love it. The future for the phone lies on the road. Sleeping in motels to make this place look like a mansion when we come back. Touch all your love and be it. All that is all right to do. And who's gonna stop me? And I don't want it to be a job. And I don't want it to be hanging around my neck. And I don't want it to hurt me. And I don't want it to ruin any part of my life. It looks like we have homicide number 83 here tonight. Guilty. That's the verdict of a Hennepin County jury tonight. First-degree murder, life imprisonment. Won't you take me to Funky Town? From director Steven Greenberg, Funky Town, the movie, where the ending has not yet been written. Funky Town, won't you take me to Welcome back, everybody, to Artifacts. With me is the infamous Al Milgram. Welcome. Infamous. Well, yeah, I think you're infamous. That's not a nice way to go through life. <laughs> How would you like to go through life? I'd just like to get this, this job done mm -hmm. and get a little bit of sleep. Yeah, yeah. And the big job that you're doing right now is getting the 17th annual yeah. Minneapolis <clears throat> St. Paul International Film Festival together. Yeah. Tell me. What, well, uh, tell me about it. What have you got going? What's well, you know, every year it's uh, looking over the crop of new films around the world from 50 countries or 35 we announced this year mm -hmm. and uh, trying to get them to Minneapolis and Minneapolis-St. Paul and it ain't easy. Mm -hmm. So um, we have probably more than 75 films. I keep thinking I want to pull back. Audi audiences say we don't get a chance to see all of the ones, the good ones, mediocre ones, but they're mostly good. Mm -hmm. So um, we're uh, trying to line up uh, stuff here at the last minute. Things, uh, it's, like, it's a huge jigsaw puzzle. And you gotta worry about trying to bring people in. The shipping bill alone runs into the tens of thousands of dollars. We're competing with the f film festivals from equivalent cities like Cleveland, Philadelphia, Houston, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Dallas, St. Louis. They're all within the same two weeks. So mm -hmm. how, many, how are you going to get films within that time to make your best case for an international film festival? Mm -hmm. Somehow, Al, though, you always manage to do it. You do. Well, you put together a great festival. Thank you, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> uh, Tell unfortunately, me. I wish someone, I wish the city, which keeps talking about the, in the mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. and the film commission and all the money they're bringing in would get behind a film festival for the common folk instead of the uh, imported Hollywood companies that want to show a little bit of Cornfields from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know what the future is going to be with this institution. It's been here for 17 years. It's hard to get. I don't. You know, Minneapolis is a big film town. It is. And I feel the town is worthy of a, one of the better, hopefully the best, uh, array of international film mm -hmm. and local film. We always try to push local filmmakers. We have some local films s set for this year. Um, through the film, uh, the Independent Feature Project, there's going to be a special weekend of Minnesota filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, you know, in the past, there's merely emphasis on world cinema and American independent cinema with a few big New York, Hollywood, uh, Miramax type blockbusters. Mm -hmm. Tell me, um, I know you've traveled the world over and you, you're bringing some excellent mm -hmm. films. Do you have any films that um, people should definitely be watching for this time around? Well, um, it seems that the way things are coalescing, um, they devolve into political themes. I've got a terrific film from Yugoslavia, mm. called Powder Keg, aptly titled. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be toward the end of the festival. And um, I'm not sure it's going to be the end of the festival or not, but um, we can get into that a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it deals with life in Belgrade. On CNN, on TV, we've had a lot of information about 
the uh, Serbian incursion into Bosnia, the, the documentary. This is a fictional film of how maybe six to, to eight Serbian Serbs who live in Belgrade understand their situation, mm -hmm. their mood, their, uh, their spirit, their uh, pessimism, their cynicism. And it's by one of the very best international filmmakers. His name is, it's not a household name, Joran Paskaljevic. Mm -hmm. Then there's another film dealing also with the Serbian situation called Wounds. <clears throat> the director has now been forbidden to work mm -hmm. in Serbia because it's so critical. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I was hoping to get a film from on the Kosovo story, The mm -hmm. Hornets, but uh, the filmmaker's email has been cut off from Belgrade. Wow. Um, the first weekend of the festival is going to be a, there's going to be a sidebar of human rights films uh, because Amnesty International is having an international conference. The middle of the festival, President Václav Havel is coming to the Twin Cities, and we're going to do a Czech spotlight. Um, then uh, there's going to be a number of very good films from we call them the emerging filmmakers. We have an emerging filmmakers competition that, which is juried, and we've had a lot of top quality entries by young persons just wanting to get into film. Uh, pretty glossy stuff coming out of NYU, New York University Film School. Mm -hmm. You know, the old days of taking out your bollocks and shooting a few scenes and, and editing them together and thinking you've got a little story just doesn't seem to wash anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, Al, I'm, I'm sorry we, we just don't have enough time to oh, get yeah. through all of the wonderful things you're doing. I think it's, it's fascinating the, the view that people can have of the world by seeing these films. You do a great service, I think, to give people a perspective that they may not otherwise have a chance to Well, it's there. See. They need to take advantage of it. The exactly. festival's going to be this year the, as uh, the sort of flagship venue at the Bell Museum. Uh, Natural History Auditorium, 17th and University Southeast, and at the Oak Street Cinema. And if we can work it out, there may be some satellite showings around, maybe one or two at the Lagoon, mm -hmm. maybe one or two at some uh, suburban outlying place. Mm -hmm. And the dates of the festival are April 16th through May 1st, right. with the best of the fest after. Yeah. That runs another week yeah. after and that. And we also, the week after the festival, we take a mini festival down to Rochester for whatever that's worth. Oh, that's great. That's great. I want to give people a phone number to call for more information. <coughs> that's 612-627-4430. And you can watch the City Pages April 14th issue. Mm. That's when the big uh, the pull -out section. big pull-out section comes out with all the films listed, yeah. times, venues, everything you need. Then. Uh, if and also, the other papers are going to carry stories sure. and calendars. Yep. And if they show up at any of the films, there will be a catalog with the full, more detailed information. Right, right. Thank you, Al, very okay. much for coming today. Thanks for having me, Janet. Really appreciate it. Good luck. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see some clips from a number of films that will be at the film festival up right after this. And then um, we'll bring you a quick arts news update. And then Phil will be back with Ralph Rapson. You're watching Artifacts on City Cable 34. I like when I see myself on TV. How come you like it so much? Because I can see how I look rather than looking in just a mirror. And I have to get something like that. I can see it in a tape. That's my favorite part about watching me on TV. Why, 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 why? No matter what they say, you ask why. Who's going to be driving this car the most? Me? You. And the wife makes you check with her first.
she doesn't make me. I understand. You don't want to get in trouble. Come back after you get permission to get that test drive. I don't need permission. Let's go. Make them drive the car. Make them touch it, feel it, smell it. Get them excited. When they're excited, they pay more. <laughs> hey! Order up, Ann. Again, the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Film Festival runs April 16th through May 1st with Best of the Fest After. Check the special pullout section in the April 14th edition of City Pages for venues and showtimes. And now, a few arts news highlights. Child's Play Theater is now Stages Theater Company. After placing greater emphasis on production and educational programs for teenagers, the organization recently changed its name. Based in Hopkins, but with a steady commitment to programming and teaching in Minneapolis, Stages Theater Company continues to work with youth at all stages of development. Governor Jesse Ventura's trade mission to the film industry in Los Angeles last month garnered some positive results. Minnesota is now looking at four potential projects that we would not have seen had it not been for the governor, governor's recent efforts. While in Los Angeles, Governor Ventura also solidified relationships with Disney and Paramount Studios and spoke with executives involved with several other projects that may soon be filmed in Minnesota. And work begins this month on restoration of Redeemer Missionary Baptist Church, located in the Lindale neighborhood in South Minneapolis. The building was designed in 1909 by William Gray Purcell and George Fike, Jr. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. A restoration campaign has raised 75% of its $2.3 million goal. And that's a quick look at the Artifacts Arts News for April 1999. Architect Ralph Rapson joins Phil next after a look at a work of art created by Denise Sanders and commissioned by the city of Minneapolis as a gift to our sister city in Ibaraki, Japan. Copies of the print are for sale to benefit the Minneapolis Ibaraki City Cultural Association. For more information, call the City Cable 34 hotline 673-2234. Well, sitting with me now is a man that uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing for a number of years on uh, at least one city commission, Ralph Rapson, architect, hey. designer, nice to have you here, and planner. And planner. That's right, although not necessarily with the capital P. Right, that's right. right. Um, I think the, uh, the pivotal reason that I thought it's time to have Ralph on the show if he was available uh, is that you're the focus of not one but two exhibits that are up right now as we sit here. Right. One at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and uh, one at the Wiseman Museum at the University of Minnesota. That's right. Could you just outline what people might see if they went to the Institute of Arts and then to the Wiseman of your work and, and depiction of your career? Well, they speak of it as a retrospective uh, exhibit. And uh, if uh, those um, who go 
to the Art Institute, we'll see essentially uh, buildings that are of more residential nature and also design for living objects, uh, fabrics, furniture, chairs, lighting, uh, uh, dinnerware, that sort of thing. Whereas the Wiseman is essentially buildings in the public realm, churches, uh, university buildings, city halls, embassies and that sort of thing. That's right. And very interestingly, as we sit here in the studios of uh, City Cable 34, we're near what once upon a time was the mayor's suite yes. on the first floor. And you told me that this very area, or at least very near here, you helped redesign for a... Yes, many mayor. years ago under P.K. Peterson, right. then mayor, we, uh, we designed this. Actually, it's a system of flexible wall sections that can, as you know, city planning offices or uh, city administrative offices change daily, it seems. <laughs> yes. and, and so it needed to have... But the, yes, that was fun. That was great. Uh, and I think folks are somewhat familiar, I would hope they are, the, with some of your public buildings. Uh, probably the first one that comes to my mind is the Guthrie Theater. And you've worked on a number of buildings that people maybe have had the chance to go into locally. Yes. Could you mention a few that you enjoyed? Well, uh, obviously, I think the Guthrie Theater is probably going to be a, a cross that I'll have to bear the rest of my life. Uh, yeah. Um, it was a stimulating and interesting uh, assignment by, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, one of the most difficult assignments I think an architect could ever have. Uh, I don't want to get into it, it's a long story, but Sir Tyrone was, uh, I call him Sir Tyrant often. Oh, so there was a little bit of the personality oh, rub? <laughs> there was, <laughs> but he was a big man, six foot eight, uh, a large jaw, beak-like nose, penetrating eyes, uh, a man whose life was one of uh, manipulating people. And, uh, and he had definite ideas of what he wanted for a theater. Mm -hmm. I had some pretty definite ideas that I wanted to accomplish. We had some marvelous, marvelous uh, sessions. Real good fights, you know. I was wondering <laughs> if what you meant by sessions, that's right. And, uh, but, you know, the interesting thing, Phil, was that even though these were often quite V uh, not violent, but they were very pointed mm -hmm. uh, discussions. Uh, come back the next day, and with Guthrie, it was almost as though it had never happened. Okay. Uh, in a sense, I th I, and perhaps it's in uh, retrospect, I think maybe it was his way of pushing me hard. I couldn't simply say, I want to do this, I want to do that. I had to defend it. Had to justify your I choices. I really had to justify what we were no. doing. And so he would push me almost to the uh, limit. Yeah. And I watched him uh, uh, training his actors. And they would rehearse a line, and they would rehearse it. And they would rehearse it. And they'd rehearse it. You know, again and again and again, until you'd almost think they'd break. And in one or two cases, I recall actors actually breaking. But he apparently knew when to pull back. Most of the time, anyhow. Yeah. Wow. And I think that was uh, partially true. Uh, Probably with any project that he took on, whether right. it was building a space yeah. or working with... But he was a very, very strong, domineering yeah. personality. Yeah. But I shouldn't get into that, because I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> well, another theater that I just learned recently you were involved in was, is Theater in the Round on the West Bank. Yes. I mm -hmm. did not know that. Now, what was your role there? Was that the whole building, or was that the interior space, or both? Oh, we started, that uh, was reclaimed space, as it were. It's been a pizza parlor. I don't quite recall what it was. It had been, I think, a number of things. Yeah. But we converted to a little theater in the round the first time around. And then later on, it was remodeled again by a, a friend of mine in our office. And uh, um, yes, oh, we've currently just been working with uh, with um, the other little theater over in our area. Um, in the West Bank? Yes. Oh, well, it slips in my mind. It'll come to me in a okay, second. Well, the Southern Theater? No. Uh, fire, uh, the uh, Mixed Blood? Mixed Blood, sorry. Sure, Jack Ruler's yes, operation. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know they were renovating or anything over there. Well, they have long-range plans oh, that we've okay. been working on. Is, easy, is Ruler easier to deal with than uh, Guthrie? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Oh, as long as we're there geographically, one of the projects that uh, you worked on for a number of years was the Cedar Riverside Planning Project. Yes. You were nice enough to bring some images that maybe as we talk, we can get up on the screen and look at some, I think Very we've got good. an aerial view and then some more detail. Do you want to talk a little bit about the genesis of that project, or where, where that came from, mm -hmm. what some of the goals were? Well, it, uh, that certainly is one of the more interesting and exciting things that I've ever had to work on. Um, actually, it started with two people, Gloria Siegel and Keith Heller. Keith was, uh, was teaching at the university in, I believe, in the uh, accounting or financial... Yeah, he aspect. came out of the business world, as I yeah. recall. Yeah. And he discovered people who were looking for uh, some kind of tax shelter. Gloria Siegel was, uh, she used to describe herself as a gadabout scholar. Um, in a sense, she was the social, the, the artistic consciousness of the project, uh, whereas Keith more or less handled the financial. Okay. Keith was a, literally, it was a walking computer. Right. Uh, but uh, they wanted to build a small project, came to me and we we did plan something over on the, uh, in the university district area. But then they finally got land on the West Bank, and by this time the university had determined that it was going to jump the river and establish the West Bank campus. So there were a number of people who were interested in buying up land and developing in that area, and Keith and Siegel were, were um, one of the group. I'm guessing this uh, was in the 60s, the 1960s? This was in the 60s, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, we worked on this project over 10, yeah. 12 years. It was a project, yeah. And uh, I kept, well, and I, finally I, I said, let's not do a single little apartment house. Let's do, let's get some land alongside of it. And then that led to, well, let's go on and see if we can't get a whole block. Right. And then a, a, another block. And, and then the block became uh, a and, and so I kept them from building for a long time mm -hmm. under the theory that we could plan right. something, you know, uh, something more significant. And I think the, no the basic notion that it was one that I believe very strongly in, and Gloria and Keith also, that this could be a demonstration of, of that you can build high density quality living within the center of the urban yeah. framework. Uh, 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 a kind of life that will encourage the arts and will encourage good living and all that. And the other thing was that it had to be a mix. Yes. It had to be a cross-section of all economic, social uh, types. So we ended up finally with uh, housing for the elderly, housing for higher income, student housing, mm -hmm market rate housing, sub subsidized housing, all of these all into one kind of uh, complex along with commercial and some light industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the way, uh, well, the kind of thing that one finds so much in many of the European cities where you get this this richness of fabric. Well, it's interesting you mention that because one of the images that we probably have already shown uh, as we've been talking, uh, sort of the near interior view of, of part of this small town that you built, yes. in effect, gave me a, a nice sort of topographical walk through just as my eye goes through. It was, yes. It's not a boring area to walk through. Well, on top of all of this, of course, was the need to, uh, to provide a lot of house, or parking. Oh, yes. So that particular shot shows a plaza but underneath that are some several That's thousand cars. cars. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's a nice solution uh, in a very dense area. Right. Um, the, uh, the feds were not at all agreeable to this kind of mix. We, I, I had the naive uh, notion that in the beginning we might be able to get it all, these all into one building, oh. you know. So you would, in your apartment or your, your living, you wouldn't know whether your neighbor was subsidized housing or, mm -hmm. uh, but they simply would not buy that. You were talking about integrating people and integrating, lifestyles. Yes, yeah. all the way through the project. Sure. Uh, we finally did. We got, we got them all in the project, but they're generally in separate buildings. Right. And incidentally, all the buildings have uh, uh, walkways connecting. There were 
part of the notion was that throughout the West Bank planning, it was to be a controlled environmental walkway system where you could go from any one part of the okay. complex uh, uh, to another without going outside. Mm -hmm. And there would be, uh, in addition to the residential and cultural recreational aspects, there would be commercial. Sure. So people mixed could in do their daily that, business uh, there a little bit. No, it was a very exciting and controversial project. I think a lot of us probably remember. I mean, the, the uh, neighborhood had one point of view. Of course, the feds came in on their side. You had your visions. And yes. I suppose working with the team of Heller and Siegel was probably yes, uh, if interesting. If I hadn't had the confidence and support of, of those people, right. we wouldn't have gotten anywhere near this far, which leads me to the notion that you know, that uh, architecture is a result of many people working on, on a project. Uh, it's not only the architect and the design, although from my perspective that's very critical and important, but there are all many other disciplines, engineers and economists and, mm -hmm. and uh, et cetera, that uh, go through a project. You lead me to a question, Ralph. Um, you've been identified as part of the design and architectural community, the American modernist movement, if I, if I can call it that, going back to some of your early studies uh, in the late 30s, I believe, with Saarinen and other folks yes. that you've studied with. How has the field of architecture changed in, in, over your period of time involved mm -hmm. with it? I know we talked earlier yeah. about the money has changed part of the dialogue. It has and it hasn't. In many ways, it's much the same as always. Uh, uh, but. Absolutely, there's a, there is a change of uh, things are moving faster. They seem to be larger. You're working with larger uh, combines, whether they be private or corporate or uh, or uh, whatever. Uh, there's uh, and I think there's very much a notion or you know in the old days there was the architect, there was the owner, and there was the builder that. Right, it was a triumvirate there, they triumvirate. worked together. And in a sense, the architect was protecting, if you will, both the owner and the builder, mm -hmm. uh, seeing that everyone got what they were essentially hoping for. And uh, But now, so many times, particularly in what is now quite, uh, becoming quite more universal, is something called design build. Right, kind of a one-stop shop a one -stop for the client. Shop, right, where the owner likes to deal with one entity. They would they give out the assignment. They want no complications. They want, they want a product delivered on time and on budget. Right. And in a sense, it means less emphasis on quality, um, maybe not so much physical quality, because I'm sure that many of them still want to keep out the elements and all that. Right. But I think the, the abstraction of architecture, the, the, the design, the delight, the, the joy of architecture. What I might just describe as the vision. The vision. The creative yes, right. notion. Those things are, are down the list, I think, in the totem pole. And uh, now with the, uh, with, the, with the builder design built, it's often the developer the finance people and so on, that are calling the shots. Sometimes politicians, very often. Uh, and so design is down the, the totem pole. We see that, uh, I think, in different uh, aspects of, of the fabric of our culture. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. in different ways. Uh, before we go on, on the other side of the university in, in southeast Minneapolis, there's mm -hmm. what's now a library that you helped, uh, what, reclaim? It had been a yes. credit union or something? Yes, it was a small building. It was designed for um, state capital credit unions, right. uh, employees of the state. Uh, I don't know quite what happened, but uh, uh, they're still around, of course, and they still operate, but uh, they sold the building, and the city, in its wisdom, decided to make a library of it. Right. And we were asked to renovate and change it, and actually it was surprisingly little change uh, yeah and maybe the 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 question of uh, of uh, repository for money is no different than books I don't know but uh, at any rate very little change so it's a very delightful now I think mm -hmm. 
library and uh, serves very useful. As, as we're talking, we've had the opportunity to look at a few images of, uh, of that library. Yes. Ralph, are there elements that we might have seen in there or indeed other works uh, that we've been talking about that would um, sort of highlight some of your signature architectural philosophy? I know one thing that comes to mind, and we've talked about this, is the large glass wall yes. to bring the outdoors in and I guess by extension yes. the inside out a little bit. Yes. Well, I, yes, I think you'd find <clears throat> one doesn't change one's handwriting on every job. It, uh, although each assignment is a different assignment and you look for the essence of that particular uh, uh, assignment. But uh, certain things do. <clears throat> I, I don't have time to get into it. I probably, uh, this would take you into a long lecture, but I have something called the Ten Commandments of Architecture. And uh, <clears throat> several of those commandments. Uh, one is historical continuity. We must know the past. We must understand it. We don't copy the past, but we have to know to go on. Uh, a second thing is the site, the region, the ecology you're working with. And you must respect the land and, uh, and all of its uh, uh, implications. A third commandment is, is people. They're the yardstick you start with. They don't change very much over the years, basically. Uh, but it's the start and the ending of all architecture. Um, then there are the materials, the structure. Uh, I think you see in state capital building strong, f highly formed concrete piers that hold up a, a precast uh, concrete roof, a large lid. And underneath that lid, uh, because of the freestanding structure, the walls can be glass or solid, transparent or opaque. And that, those principles, I think, often follow through on many of our jobs, where we uh, often will start with, uh, with a very ordered, let us say, box-like form. And then I begin to tear it apart and to open it up and to uh, I don't so much think so much anymore of windows or on walls, but I think of transparency and solids, the play of light and shadow and, sh and, uh, and um, just the coming and going and the various inter And I think you find that in things like our Pillsbury House, the... Uh, that was on uh, uh, by Lake Minnetonka? Lake Minnetonka, yes. which was destroyed uh, last year. Yeah. Uh, you find it in in this little state capital mm -hmm. or southeast branch library. You find it in a way in, uh, in Cedar Riverside, incidentally. That complex goes all the way from one and two and three story buildings, you know, 12, 10, 8, 16, yes. 40 floors. Yeah. There's a richness there of heights and texture and of orientation. There's uh, to, to capture views, to uh, capture openness and it's high density stuff it's it's the density of Harlem for instance but you don't know it it's a uh, it's very open all of those things and uh, what I'm really now talking about are some of the you know the Vitruvius in his very in the early days of Rome described architecture as commodity firmness and delight by commodity he meant the structure the materials and all that by uh, or commodity is the use, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And then firmness of the materials. And then delight. And what is that? You know, that's, the, that's that intangible thing. That's where the human experience uh, human comes Human experience into comes, it. the genius of the yes. designer. Or the genius of people who are using the buildings, etc. And that's, that's the art of architecture. All of the rest of this, the materials and all of that are the Philip Johnson, you know, the famous New York architect, uh, Philip says that without the art of architecture, you only have plumbing. And, uh, <laughs> and elevator banks. <laughs> and elevator That's about banks, it. Yeah. Some vertical. So, uh, uh, well, those are kind of common signature handwriting things. Uh, lots of glass, uh, understanding the, the region or the climate, uh, the site. Uh, understanding people, mm -hmm. good use of materials. I don't care whether they're concrete, wood, but traditional materials are old or mm -hmm. new materials. 
all of those things. And I think architecture is a totality of a lot of things and a lot of people operating. I saw one of your uh, drafts or designs for a, uh, I believe it was a church in North Dakota in which you wanted it to, I, my term, but to soar with the geology. You mentioned the location, yes. the site yeah. is important. That was very definitely a response to the rolling yeah. hills. Right. And in my mind, when I saw that image, it shows that one need not be limited, limited by what um, someone might see as simply a, a, a plain, literally a plain field. Right. There's a lot to articulate there. In and then what we were doing was we piled up earth, put the reinforcing down, and then poured the concrete, and then took the earth away. Oh, interesting. So uh, we didn't build forms in the normal fashion. Yeah. We used the earth to, because we could carve it like a, well, you know, how kids make sand castles in the sun, sure. you know. Sure. And, uh, then we simply put the reinforcing over and poured the concrete on that. Ralph, let me ask you a, a personal question. Uh, it's, it's always easy to run the tape backwards and say, okay, 60 years of design, architecture, planning, urban involvement, urban design. What inspired you early on, apparently as a very young man, maybe as a child, mm -hmm. to get involved with the habitation where people are, the built environment as yeah. well as the natural? What, that's, what keyed you here? Well, I've been asked that, and I don't exactly know the answer, except that I, uh, as far back as I can remember, I drew. Okay. I, I, I suppose I, in my early thinking, I probably thought of being an artist. And I, but I And you do paint. Oh, yes, I do yeah. paint and draw and yeah. a good deal. But uh, people always said, well, you know, you can't make a living at that, you know. So I, I, I suppose I... Uh, found something that looked sort of architecture, art, you know, same, but, but no, a kind of an amusing thing is I was a, in high, I think it was in um, junior high, I wrote one of those career papers, and I, I had discovered architecture. I called it architectural engineering, but even then I, I remember ending up the paper by saying that, that the art of architecture always had to be more important than the engineering of architecture. Uh, and I don't mean to slight engineering in the sense at all, but uh, but uh, no, I, I I drew a lot, and I uh, um, actually I was courting a young lady whose father was a carpenter, and so when I would visit her, I saw copies of the American Builder and okay. uh, some of those old carpenter esque. Yeah. Uh, so that helped, but but basically, I think it was. And nearby, in a small town near where I grew up, uh, in Okemos, Michigan, mm -hmm. was one of Frank Lloyd Wright's early Usonian houses, uh, which I got uh, to know reasonably well. And Wright was the first architect I knew much about. And, well, that was uh, serendipitous to connect. Yeah, yes. Right there. Ralph, we've got just a moment left. I also want to mention and make note of the fact that in, in relationship to uh, these two exhibits that are up at the Institute of Arts and at mm -hmm. the Wiseman, there is a, uh, a book just okay. published about you, and you happen to know a little bit about the book and the folks that put it together. Uh, I believe your son, uh, Rip, had a hand in this? Yes, my oldest uh, boy, Rip uh, Rapson, is the, one of the authors along with uh, Jane Hessian. Uh, and, and Bruce right, Wright. Bruce Wright here, yep. And uh, it's, uh, it's probably not appropriate for me to say, but I think it's a very exciting, very lively book. Not so much because of the, necessarily that I'm involved, but the, the graphics are great, the, the uh, composition, the storyline that runs through it all. Uh, it's not the typical architectural book. It's a uh, it's more of a process. A little more engaging, it sounds there, like. There are all kinds of studies and sketches from very preliminary things to final drawings. Sounds good. And it, uh, it, uh, it really is a fun, fun kind of book. Well, great. Ralph, thank you for coming and sharing a little bit well, with us about you. your design, your architecture you. work. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. And those two exhibits will be at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. I believe that goes into July and uh, well into the month of May right. at the Wiseman at the University. Now, coming up next, right here in our studios, a rousing performance by members of a venerable Minneapolis-based dance company, the Ethnic Dance Theater. I'll join them to talk about their upcoming 25th anniversary events right after the dance. Stay tuned.
wonderful. I want to thank Lynn Petros yes. from Ethnic Dance Theater and Donald LaCourse. Thank you both for being thank here. You. Now, what you've been watching was just a little snippet, uh, part of a much larger piece. Now, that was a Hungarian dance? Yes. And the name of it is? Dances from Satmar, Hungary. Okay, and the reason we're having these folks on is to let people know that you are celebrating your 25th anniversary as a company here in the Twin Cities. Yes, 1974 was our start in May. That's amazing. And in May of this year, the whole series of events are happening, including some concerts that are coming up. Yes, May 6th, 7th, 8th, and 13th, 14th, 15th. Wow, and this is happening over in uh, St. Paul. E.M. Pearson Theater at Concordia at University. At Concordia University, so congratulations. Thank you. And that particular piece, as I understand, you have got, what, 11 or 12 couples? 11 are... couples and 10 singers. It's lots and lots of people. I don't think we've ever had more dynamic energy in the smallest space that we just <laughs> had here in the studio, so I want to thank you. Now, Donald, if there's a phone number people can call to get tickets for both those Absolutely. events and other things? Area code 612. 782-3970. Okay, and that's the Ethnic Dance Theater. You're headquartered up in Northeast Minneapolis. Yes. I'm and you've been there a while, Central Avenue. Right. So, Donald, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Lynn, us. a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, stay tuned. Jan will be back to wrap up the show with me in just a moment. People are basically generally nice, I have to say, and generous. And people aren't, um, they look funny. Uh... Hey, Claudia. All right. So this is your car. Yeah. This is your car, right? Yeah. Now yeah, this has to break into the news. It's all right. You want to be interviewed? Okay. We're doing a short film. But we're going to have to leave. Yeah. Would you like to be uh, interviewed for our film? Oh, that's okay. Thank you, though. You'll be animated. You'll be an animated cartoon character. Huh? You'll be an animated cartoon character. An animated cartoon character? That was the clip from Roadhead, a digital video documentary that will be featured as, as part of IFP North's Overbite, that's over.byte event, during the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Film Festival. Overbite will include panels, screenings, discussions, and parties with the maverick artists of the digital revolution, including Tommy Pallotta, whose work you just saw. Big event. Find out more by calling IFP North at 338-0871. You know, this whole show was kind of a big event. I mean, when you it think was. of the awesome level of talent that everybody on the show has had. Indeed. Yeah. Awe-inspiring. Yeah. Perhaps not infamous. No, no. I have to no, say, no. but... Um, no, but the far-reaching effects absolutely. of Al Milgram and uh, Ralph Rapson and the statewide effort that uh, Mean Larry's involved in. Yep, That's yep. right. And Ethnic Dance Theater. Congratulations again. 25 years. Indeed. That's pretty darn good. We got some events. We got a lot of things coming on here. <laughs> um, there's a one-woman show by Chantus Rhoda Reitgard, Reitgard, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Road, Warthog Blues. That's happening um, uh, April 6th through the 14th at the Bryant Lake Bowl. And she's described as a delightfully skewed sensibility and dynamo voice. She sounds great. I want to let you know that on, I believe it is... April 30th, Friday night, the ITVA uh, International Television Association Film and Video Festival, Twin Cities Annual Video Festival is happening over in St. Paul. Um, but it's a great event. If you want to see the best in corporate film and video, this is the place to do it, do it Friday, April 30th. And you can plan because that's the end of the month. Yeah. In the middle of the month, on the 10th of April, is the famous maybe infamous, <laughs> uh, gallery crawl in downtown Minneapolis. So put on some black clothes and crawl through some galleries. Crawl, crawl, crawl. We've also got, oh, this is a nice announcement. VSA Minnesota, formerly known as Very Special Arts Minnesota, but it's now officially known as VSA Minnesota, uh, is an, has announced a funding opportunity for Minnesotans active in the arts who have a disability. So it's called Emerging Artists with Disabilities. It's a grant program, and uh, you have until May 7th to get your application in. You can call 612-332-3888 for information on that. Keep going. Also, April is National, National Poetry, Poetry Month. Month. And you can read this one. April is School Library Month, too. So go to a school library, read some poetry. And this just in, <laughs> as I was coming over here to tape, there's, they've renamed a bus route in, in Minneapolis downtown. It's called the uh, Arts and Eats Express. Cool. And it kind of goes over from the Guthrie Walker, Loring Park area, mm -hmm. down through downtown, down <laughs> past uh, the Institute of Arts, and points south. That's kind of neat. I'm getting on that bus, two of my favorite things. Arts and Food eats. Food and art. That's right. <laughs> and a guy right. named Art. I don't know who else will be on there. So. So. That's it. That's it. Nice show. Mm -hmm. uh, next month, more surprises. Grab your pens, paper, pencil, and Crayolas, because at the end of this show, uh, with, uh, I think, a nice tune underneath mm -hmm. it from uh, Mr. Burnett, um, is our Artifacts calendar. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm Janet Sun. And I'm still Phil Lindsay. We'll see you next time.
This month's Artifacts giveaway is a collector's item. From Minneapolis's rich musical history, a 45 single of Tom Burnett's classic tune, The Minneapolis. In the days when vinyl was still king, Burnett and his big band Express recorded this little ditty singing the praises of his hometown. The song became an icon at local festivals and public events. And now this nugget of Minneapolis's musical history could be yours if you're the seventh caller to leave your name and phone number on the City Cable 34 Highline at 673-2234. Be sure to tell us you're watching Artifacts too. That number again 6732234 beautiful city fun loving people and it's really something the Minneapolis your car is jumping on potholes in the street but you can't see them for they're hiding they're under snow that is six feet deep And in the summer, the Minneapolis will fall in love to the calling of the loop. And all those lovers are so enchanted, they roller skate around Lake Calhoun. We love outdoor activity. The skyways are just the place to be when we are shoveling the Minneapolis and making slush for the salt lines and your shoes. Then we will send it out to Edina, where they're all listed in New Zoo. Well, it hurts. Hurts to discover that mosquitoes bite everything in sight. And you flirt, flirt with your lover, and your Christmas wish, it comes with ludicrous. And even though the Vikings want to bust us home, we're planning secret tailgate parties at the dome. The whole world gets shouting oof. Cause we're a million folks whose spirits soar We all love Mary and Tyler Moore And we'll do the many apples 